Blog Talk Radio. Archangels, Ghosts, and Bigfoot, oh my, it's just another night for Supernatural Girls. Real stories, real answers to life's biggest supernatural mysteries. And now, for another exciting interview with paranormal experts from this world and others, here's your host, paranormal researcher Patricia Baker, on the one, the only, Supernatural Girls. Welcome, everyone, to another exciting episode of Supernatural Girls Radio. I'm your host, Patricia Baker, and I'm here with my co-host, PK, Patricia Kirkman. How are you doing tonight? I am just sitting here all huddled up and cuddled up and waiting for this exciting show we're going to have tonight. Oh, my goodness. We have a great guest tonight. Yes, we have we Dr... Edward Bruce Bynum. Hey, he's from my neck of the woods. He is from Massachusetts. I noticed that. Yeah. Isn't that something? Oh, and he's, <laughs> yeah, he's joining us to talk about the dream life of families. His new book, The Psycho Spiritual Connection, he is an expert on this, and we're so glad to have him with us tonight. We're going to bring him on in a few minutes. But first, we got to talk about a bunch of stuff happening. Did you know yes. there was an earthquake in Tennessee, of all places? No, yeah, that was incredible. I know. And my friend contacted me from Atlanta. She said, we felt it here. It was a 4.4 where I am in Atlanta. So this uh, is not a good sign because this is right on the New Madrid Fault, which yes, I don't know if is. everybody's familiar with that one, but if that goes, that could be pretty bad. In fact, when it did go big, and it was, I think, an eight point something on the Richter scale in the 1800s, that church bells rang in New England when it hit down south. So that's how big of an earthquake it was. So, again, so much rocking and rolling, so many changes. So many strange sights in the sky. Everything is moving. Everything is moving fast. So there's a lot happening. We've got to be able to cover as much as possible in our brief introduction tonight. Now, again, I want to mention for people who want to know what their numbers look like in the coming year, make sure you contact PK at patriciakirkman.com or on the supernaturalgirls.com website and make sure you book an appointment to find out what's coming up for you. If you want the soul realignment work that I've been certified in with Andrea Hess, then be sure to contact me and you can find me at supernaturalgirlsalso.com. So be happy to work with you, whatever your personal and spiritual goals are. We are here to help. So, PK, you've got some interesting things with the numbers tonight. Tell us about that. Well, I got to thinking we all get stymied in finding gifts for others. And you'll find the complete uh, part of this will be on my uh, PatriciaKirkman.com page. But this is a little brief to show you how to take a look. I call It's gift by the numbers. If you take a person's birth month and birth day and add them together, to a single digit, and then add three for the coming year, that will tell you what this person's type is. Like a person whose month, day, and year, or excuse me, month, day, and the, the new year being the three, added together, if they end up being a one, these are people that are very interested in things that are different. So look for you things that are unique. That's for a one person. A two person Look for gifts that are more uh, personal, uh, more loving. Think about a bottle of wine or a dinner for two. Interested in things that are more frivolous or socialite type. I'll get a perfume or something like that. A four person would, they're easy. They just like things that work. They're things that save work, you know? And wow, a five that's person, interesting. Yeah, they, they love change. Anything that gives them a lot of changes, they'll love that. 
A sixth person likes things that deal for the family, organization of a trip, maybe a little cozy surrounding area for the family type venture. Anyone that totals a seven, they're more interested in spirituality or education of some form. So get them something like that. Even get them areas to go by or around water. That will be a feel good. Those that total an eight, they like to spend money on them. They like to have the best of everything. So make given the best you can with your budget. Think about it that way. And those that are in a nine, they like the theater or anything to do with the arts, something of that type. So that gives you a little brief look at what your friends or family might be interested in instead of just going out cruising the stores. Something will pop up towards what their needs are. So you add their month and day together and the three for the coming year that will tell you what type of a personality they're going to be in 2019. And so you want oh, to give them something that's going to set them off into a great, a great trial run for the new new year. That is a wonderful way to approach gift giving, and it makes a lot of sense. You're not just giving them something that you find in the store, like you said, but it's something more attuned to who they are. So that's mm-hmm. also more information about the gift giving based on the numbers. You can find that on Patricia Kirkman's website, patriciakirkman.com. So be sure to take a look. And you'll be sure to get the right gift. How wonderful, huh? That's great. That is absolutely great. Well, to me, it always works because it takes some of the pain out of looking for someone that you don't see that often, but you want to make sure they get something special. Yeah, that's so nice. I like that. That's wonderful. Now, I wanted to also go into the uh, paranormal stuff that we've been working on. And as you know... George Lugo, who will be joining us next week, is a very famous George Lugo, an incredible Mm -hmm. psychic medium. In our opinion, he's the best in the world, and he'll be joining us for next week's show. But what George and I did this past week was we joined up on Skype with Kai Meggie, who is a very powerful physical medium. And we Mm -hmm. began doing, renewing, I should say, our American Skull experiment, which you know we used to do with Becky and with Helene before they passed away. So George and I decided it was time to start this up again, and we invited Kai in, and we had some very unusual things happen. And the audio is remarkable. So what I did was I asked Our friend Jeff, who is an audio expert, and he works on producing the show Dancing with Ghosts, to take a Mm -hmm. listen to our audio and tell us what he hears. Because one of the things that people talk about, now you know about the missing, the 411 series with David Politis and things that happens when somebody's on a cell phone and they're talking to someone and they go missing. The person on the other end of the phone has talked about hearing a strange type of a wind sound. So when we went to do this work together, that's what happened. We started to hear this very odd wind sound as well as some other chirping, some unexplained noises that were not coming from where I am, where George was in Florida or where Kai was in Germany. So we are going to wait with bated breath to find out what Jeff has to say about this audio. And it was quite startling, quite remarkable. We got some wild photos that I'll be sharing with everybody in our audience, and we will be continuing this work. It is quite amazing, quite amazing, everybody. So we'll keep you posted. And then, now, PK, you and I have been talking about all this UFO stuff. We know we're never going to get disclosure from the government. It's just not going to happen because it's not in their best interest. But all the UFO reports that have been coming in lately from pilots. Oh, it sounds like crazy. And, and yes, and people are sent. In fact, there were two sightings in Massachusetts just recently. People took video and photographs, reported it to MUFON. And our dear friend Bob Lucas sent me uh, one of them. It was it was just an amazing photograph. No doubt that this was not one of ours. So there was a story, and I posted it 
on our Facebook page, which everybody make sure you go to our Facebook page, make sure you like and follow us there because we always have great stories to tell about what's happening, especially in the UFO world. But the Royal Air Force scrambled to intercept an unidentified aircraft over England. Now, this just Mm -hmm. happened, and this occurred over Hull, England, this week. So uh, it's just an incredible experience when a pilot is talking about it and when an aircraft is dispatched to try to intervene and, and do something else with this unidentified aircraft. I guess they didn't get very far. But it definitely was uh, something that they couldn't keep up with. And you got to read the story. It's on our Facebook page. And this is just one of many, many, many UFO stories and sightings. They seem to be just uh, just increasing exponentially. And PK, you said that this was going to happen. And once again, you're mm-hmm. right. Look at all this stuff going on, all these sightings today. There's going to be so much communication this coming year about the things that are different and things that are strange. February's got something going for it. And I, there's going to be some changes, whether somebody has to admit or fess up to what's really going on, but there's going to be some games played in January and people are going to start to get angry, but come February, something's going to pop out from it. And they're oh, I going can't to, wait. to deny everything. Oh, goody. Well, I'm ready, and I know our audience is ready. So Heavens, yes. <laughs> we are waiting. It's not that far away, So especially the way time's moving so fast. So before you know it, it'll be here, and we'll find out that what you predicted is coming to pass again. So tonight we have, as we talked about, a terrific guest. He's from Massachusetts. Yay, my neck of the woods uh-huh. here. Nate. I know it's nice to have somebody from my home state. Yeah. His name is Dr. Edward Bruce Bynum, and he is a clinical psychologist and former director of the behavioral medicine program at the University of Massachusetts Health Services. Now, he's an author of several books, including Dark Light mm-hmm. Consciousness. And he's currently in private practice at the Brain Analysis and Neurodevelopment Center in Hadley, Massachusetts. And the name of his new book, which is terrific, it would make a great Christmas present, by the way, The Dream Life yes, of would. Families. Yes, The Psycho-Spiritual Connection. So, Dr. Bynum, welcome to the show. Good to be here, Patricia. And, uh, and I'm hoping that we have a live uh, discussion because this, this is something close to me and actually it's close and dear to uh, most people I know. This is about family life and about our dream life and how the two intersect uh, in uh, ordinary ways but sometimes in extraordinary ways. Now you've been involved with dream analysis and working with families with dreams for many, many years but what was it that took you down that road? Well, um, there's no one thing. I remember uh, very clearly as a uh, child listening to my grandparents talk about dreams. And they would talk about the ordinary night dreams, but they'd also talk about the dreams they had of their own parents and their own great-great-grandparents. And so I grew up in a culture where talking about dreams and dream life and the way dreams reflected our inner lives and our family lives was quite common. And so I kept an interest in that all the way through, you know, grammar school and high school and um, and uh, in college. But it was only in, when I got to uh, um, a graduate school uh, that I began to, a scientific and clinical study of this. And I actually, I wanted to do my original doctoral dissertation in this area, but my professors wouldn't hear about it. Uh, although oh, they no. allowed me to, they said I could use the laboratory at night but none wanted to be directly associated with it. But curiously enough, all these other psychologists were very interested in it. In any event, I continued my study in it. And then when I went to uh, my postgraduate studies at a private psychiatric hospital in Connecticut, I began to ask people, because we were doing a lot of family therapy, I began to ask families and individuals and families write down their dreams and to uh, share them with me 
Don't share them with each other yet because I didn't want things contaminated, but write them down and give them to me. And, and uh, let me sort of like uh, indulge my own interest in that for a while. And then after collecting hundreds of these, I was more than pleasantly surprised to see the interconnections and the web of uh, corresponding uh, relationships and webs of relationships between family members, dream life, physical health, and so on. And so out of that came the book, The Dream Life of Families. And uh, that has been a a passion of mine now for uh, uh, a couple of decades. Now, with what you have found, I mean, it it must be fascinating on so many levels, but but how does it help people? Tell our audience, if you would, exactly the mechanism of this. How does it help people to heal the family wounds or the family, the lack of communication or the dysfunction in the family, how does it do that? Well, dreams are uh, our most uh, intimate expression of our emotional life. I mean, they're not, dreams are not logical. Uh, they are emotional and psychological, but they tell us what we really think. They, they, are, they are our personal mythology. And I've found that uh, when people are locked inside of themselves, even though they may be trying to communicate, they're locked inside of themselves for various reasons. Sometimes talking about the dreams that we have has been extremely helpful. It's like a painting, you know? Uh, you, yes. you can't tell that much from one painting. But if you and I went to a museum and there was a retrospective of this uh, person's work, her, this, this artist, and we walked into the museum and we saw her work displayed uh, over many generations and we saw dozens and dozens of her paintings, we would begin to notice after a while that there were similarities in her paintings, right? Right. Well, we do the same Mm -hmm. thing with dream life and family life because uh, uh, dreams are our most deeply expressive of our emotions, not our thoughts, but our emotions and the bedrock of all of our deep relationships come out of our families. So if you take the, the river of dream life and the river of emotional family life and you bring the two together, you have an ocean of commonality and intimacy that is not logical, but deeply emotional, mythic, and uh, transcends the categories of rationality. And at the same time, it's quite scientific and quite clinical. So can you give us an example of a family you worked with and how the dream experience brought everybody to a new understanding? Yes. I was working uh, with a, uh, and this is part uh, of uh, the dream series I have in the dream life of families. I was in uh, a private psychiatric hospital, and uh, the patient, the identified patient we call it, was the daughter of a um, daughter of a married couple, and they have her two daughters, okay? And uh, the uh, daughter who was hospitalized um, was hospitalized because she was, um, let's say, uh, not behaving the way the family wanted to in reference to uh, her relationships with boys uh, her age. And also um, the family was quite dysfunctional in terms of uh, communicating with each other. And they couldn't quite figure out how to get out of, the, out of the situation they were in. They felt overwhelmed by it. So I asked them to write down their dreams for me. Don't share them with each other, but write down their dreams for me to see if maybe there were some way, some commonalities, some uh, shared experiences that might bring them together. Well, the daughter uh, dreamed that... Um, she was running away a lot from her family, and she would almost get away from her family, except just as she was about to get away, she ran, she drove her a car headlong into a tree. Boom, oh. and that was the end of it. Right. Mm. Another daughter, a younger daughter, dreamed that a large, awful man was running around stepping on everybody and crushing everybody uh, to death, and she couldn't escape. And then the mother of this family uh, dreamed that she was often confined and um, uh, couldn't escape and was feeling like she was drowning. Well, 
The family that produced this series of dreams consisted of a, of a mother, a teenage daughter who was a hospitalized patient, and a pre-teenage daughter, and a uh, father. And it turned out that it, the uh, father was really the one who was quite uh, uh, unsettled. And all of them dreamed that he was trying in one way or another to control and yet subvert and crush them. And all of this came out in their different dreams in different ways. In other words, everybody had a different painting of the same emotional conflict. And by sharing this at my behest, they were able to recognize that they were all, in a sense, imprisoning each other. And this opened up the sessions. And the father was able to sort of back off to see that as much as he tried to control things, he only made things worse. And the daughters saw that they're trying to uh, escape in their own ways led to a failure on their part. And it opened up the family session. And so we worked with our dreams in that session. So that's how the dreams were extremely helpful in that situation. Again, each person spun their own myth, their own story, their own symbols. But underneath, the emotions were the same in everybody from a slightly different point of view. That is and absolutely I tried to work that into brilliant. a theory. Yeah, and it's I tried great to work because... that into a theory in, in, the, in the dreams, how that happens. So, and so there's chapters on uh, how that occurs with families that come in with, uh, say, uh, and the primary symptoms of ACOA, or adult children of alcoholics. I have a whole chapter in there about pregnancy and dreams because each trimester of the pregnancy, people tend to have slightly different dreams, the father, the mother. Uh, about the uh, the child uh, coming. There's another chapter uh, about how the families dream about physical health. And sometimes, and some of your readers and, and listeners will be very interested in this, sometimes dreams foretell of physical illnesses within ourselves. They t- foretell illnesses, physical illnesses that we oftentimes have. These are called prodromal uh, dreams. And, and they're uh, quite finally, accurate, right? They're, all yes, these they themes are. about health uh, issues can be extremely accurate. I know we've had people on the show that have talked about that, where they've had dreams foretelling their cancer or something yes, like that. And it's amazing how accurate it yeah, is. The, yes, the clinical literature uh, is, is aware of that. They're called prodromal dreams. <clears throat> they even have a name. And... Um, well, if you think about it, I mean, most of our body is unconscious. We can't be thinking about everything that's going on in our bodies. You, you'd be overwhelmed. Right. So most of the dream, most of our body is unconscious, and the dreams that we have come out of the unconscious. So you have these two rivers flowing into each other, into the common ocean of our experience. And our dreams, because they don't have to be limited by logical, rational, waking state confines, are free to express a vast array of feelings. It's like it's like painting or a movie. A painting and a movie can express many things simultaneously. Well, that's how our dreams are. Every night when we go to sleep, you write a movie. And that movie may be different from night to night, but that movie is about your emotional life. Sometimes you like it, sometimes you don't. It's just like a family member. <laughs> right. Sometimes yes, you, you exactly. get along with people in our family. Sometimes we don't so get along with people in our families. But in either way, this is what our emotional life is like. And so that is what the dream life of families is about and broken down into different ways in which we deal with that. And because my training formally as a doctor is in clinical psychology, I was able to sort of draw upon the clinical literature in addition to uh, the laboratory literature. And as we were talking about before, I try to break it so that there's a history because we're not the first time in history that people have been interested in this. The ancient Greeks and Egyptians and uh, uh, indigenous American peoples have always been interested in our dreams. We've been fascinated by dreams ever since we were in the caves and the savannas of Africa. And so we're, we're just a modern retelling of that. But now we have experimental science and experimental medicine to back up what's going on in our brains and our bodies as we dream. Mm-hmm. When someone says that they don't remember their dreams, 
the odds are they remember a portion of it, but they don't draw on it to get it out. Consequently, don't they lose some of that uh, issue of what's going on with Time. the family unit? Well, they can. Uh, most people, um, you know, depending largely on, on how your culture and your family respond to it, um, we remember our dreams or we don't remember our dreams, but we do dream. Mm-hmm. In fact, oh, yeah. we run into a lot of trouble if we don't dream. Your, 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 your brain, not, on, not only your mind, but your dream, you ha- your brain has to dream. It's a physiological phenomenon. On average, roughly every 90 minutes when we're asleep, we, our, our brain goes into a cycle called REM, R-E-M, a rapid eye mm-hmm. movement, where our right. eyes move back and forth, back and forth. That's when we're having a dream. Well, if, you, if we stop a person from dreaming, if you stop a person from dreaming long enough, they will go, they'll go a little crazy. In World War II, uh, not World War II, in the Korean War, one of the mm-hmm. techniques the North Koreans uh, uh, perfected for brainwashing is right. they didn't allow a person to sleep. That's right. Now, the first, you know, every time they'd fall asleep, start falling asleep, they'd wake them up. Well, the first 24 hours, you know, the average person could handle that, okay? And then after 36 hours of not sleeping and dreaming, mm-hmm. uh, the person starts getting a little woozy, but they can still hold it together. 48 hours without dreaming, the mind begins to play tricks, and you're not sure if you're waking or dreaming. And then after about 60 hours of no dreaming, a person is not sure if they're awake, sleep, dreaming, or whatever, and that's when they can... Uh, uh, shall we say, um, make a suggestion to the person. If you've ever seen the movie The Manchurian Candidate, yeah, right. That's, that's uh-huh. how that's done. It's a brainwashing technique. Our brain has to dream. It is a physiological phenomenon. We have to dream. Otherwise, we become psychotic. It's true. Now, what happens mm-hmm. with when you cannot remember your dreams? Because many people have said to us, we can't remember our dreams. So why is that? Well, why do some people have the ability and some don't? No, it's not. It's not a matter of ability. I, I want I want folks to hear that real clear. It's not a matter of ability to remember our dreams. We all have the ability to remember our dreams. It's whether we uh, are in a in a situation or a culture or a value system that wants to remember your dreams. Here's a simple thing: if you say that a person listening right now says, "Well, gee, you know, I'm listening to this and this is very interesting, Doc," but I don't I don't remember any of my dreams. Well, if you were my patient, I would ask you to do the following. I'd ask you to uh, get a notebook and put it beside your bed, okay, with a pencil and, uh, and uh, leave it beside your bed. Mm-hmm. Any fragment of a memory you have at night, write it down when you get up in the morning. Well, first few days, you're not going to remember anything. You just wake up and you go, darn, no more memories of my dreams. After a couple of weeks, though, you begin to remember little fragments of your dream, just little bits of it. Write it down, I'd say. Please, write it down, very importantly, and date it and give it a name, no matter, even if it's just a little image. Doing that, and you begin to give your, your unconscious mind the message, dreams are important. Remember them. Dreams are important. After a few months, your dreams will start coming back to you. It's not that the dreams weren't there. They're already there because you have to dream. It says that you developed a culture of remembering the dreams. It also works the other way. <laughs> I have an episode I'd like to share with folks. Um, yes. As I said, I started taking a, uh, a scientific interest uh, in my dreams uh, when um, I was in um, uh, beginning in college. And I was a viv- very vivid dreamer. I mean, I have dreams every night. And finally I said, okay, Bruce, it's time to make a, a, a scientific deep study of your dreams. So I got myself a notebook, and I said, okay, that's it. I'm going to start writing down my dreams. Got that notebook, put it beside my bed. I was having dreams every night. Let's go. From that point on, I didn't have a single dream I remembered. Oh, oh no. <laughs> Why is that? That's right. that's right. That's oh. right. And it took me about took me about – Three to four months before my dreams started coming back to me in memory. Well, what and that why was, would that be? Because that was my mind saying no. That's called repression. 
Okay. Wow. <laughs> your mind just says, "Nope, you're not gonna, you're not gonna, you know, I don't want you looking at this too close." <laughs> and I, you know, and I knew what it what it was, but you can't do anything about it except stay with it, stay with it, stay with it. Well, after about three or four months, little bits in of my dreams started being remembered. And then after a few more months, I was remembering my dreams on a regular basis again. But my mind stepped in. My hand impression and said no. <laughs> wow. So it was an interesting uh, lesson in humility. Mind. Interesting lesson yes. in humility because a part of me uh, didn't want to really understand what my dreams were saying <laughs> to me. And it took me a while to get to the point where I was able to sort of, uh, again, after about a half a year, to uh, have them come back as vividly as they are now. Wow. See, so we all have this aspect of our mind. It's called the mm-hmm. unconscious, and uh, it's called repression or suppression. And Freud mm-hmm. was one of the first ones to really uncover this, you know. Yes, yes. PK, you had a question? Uh, well, I was thinking because since you and I have talked, and because of what you yourself do, I always get a little intimidated because I very rarely ever remember a dream. I feel like I don't dream. And once in a blue moon, I'll remember something. But frames in between are so few and far between itself. So I'm going to definitely try your uh, keep the notepad by the bed and see what happens. Keep the notepad Less by your bed. Talk about these great keep dreams. it there and, and, and go easy on yourself. Don't, don't, you know, take a humorous attitude, a critical attitude. Oh, I can't remember. No, 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 no. Okay. You're going to catch you're much more likely to catch it with with sweet things, and uh, humor, and uh, and uh, uh, wit than you are with criticism. You know, after a while, mm-hmm. you'll begin to remember the dreams. But you're already dreaming. It's not a matter that you're not dreaming. You are re- you are dreaming. We have to dream roughly every ninety minutes. And by the way, as we dream through the night, our dreams get longer. They do. We're much more likely to have a long dream later on in the night. Our first dream only lasts about, you know, three or four minutes. We go down into deep sleep, and as we're coming up from deep sleep, we're almost awake, almost awake, almost awake. That's when the dream happens. The dream doesn't happen in deep, deep sleep. No, it doesn't. It happens almost when you wake up. Yep, when your brain waves at a certain point and you're almost in the waking state, that's when you dream. And then you dream a little bit, and then you go back and lower it into deeper into sleep, mm-hmm. but not quite as deep, not quite as deep. And then another 90-minute cycle, you come back up again, and you don't wake up, but you dream. And this time the dream can be, you know, seven, nine minutes. And then you go back down into the sleep state, and then you come back up again. And this time the dream can last up to half an hour or so. But the dream gets longer mm-hmm. as we go through the night. Dreams, oh, dreams, pick, yeah, dream, yeah, dreams, 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 dreams pick up on what happened recently, usually the last three or four days, mix it in with stuff that happened a long, long, long time ago. It compresses it, turns them into symbols, okay, and then that becomes the dream life. So the dream is much more often a little movie, and some movies are very realistic, you know, you can't tell the difference on waking state, whether that was a uh, sort of a conversation you have with someone or a dream. But some dreams obviously are deeply symbolic and, you know, uh, you're, 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 on the, uh, you're on the Titanic and you're talking to the people who are the, the musical band on the Titanic and you're asking them this and that and so on and so forth. It seems realistic that you're doing it. And then you wake up in the morning and you realize, oh, that was a dream. But at the time you were having that experience, it seemed very realistic. And in point of fact, uh, dreams can have all kinds of bizarre things going on. But most of the time when it's actually happening, it's just regular reality to you. You're sitting uh, 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 in a restaurant and uh, all of a sudden uh, Michelle Obama comes in and she's uh, talking with Donald Trump. And then they go out both and get into a car, and they're going to go to the donut shop. And you want to know, uh, can you join them in the donut shop? And they say, well, yeah, there's enough room. Come on, get in the car. And so you get in the car, <laughs> and you go with them. 
to the donut shop. When you wake up in the morning, you say, well, that was obviously a dream. But <laughs> when you were having yes. it, it was just regular, of course. Oh. I'm going to go to the right. donut with Michelle Obama. Right. Amazing. Right. Now, so uh, now we were doing that all the time. You talk about, Dr. Bynum, the fact that people have precognitive dreams often about health, or they can about health. Now, what about having a dream that also gives you a treatment that says this is what you need to do to get well? Have you found some of your patients have experienced that? I've only found a smaller number of my patients who've, who've, who've been sophisticated enough to be able to get information about what they should do about a situation in a dream. More often, the dream will tell them about what they are afraid of or what they hope for uh, or what might happen as a result of their illness. It takes a pretty sophisticated person, though, uh, to find out, to get from a dream what they ought to do about their situation from the dreams. Now, don't get me wrong, dreams are often problem-solving situations, uh, and you can, but you, uh, the, the best way to do that is to incubate what's called incubated dream. What does that mean? You can actually, uh, it takes a little while, but you can actually set it up so that you can have a certain kind of dream or a certain kind of reaction to a dream, hmm. and it's called dream, dream incubation, where you, you say to yourself each night before you go to sleep, tonight I'm going to dream about, let's say, Let's say you want to become aware or, or lucid, it's called, in a dream. You want to be aware that you are dreaming. And you say to yourself during the day and before you go to sleep at night, tonight I will, be, I will awaken in my dreams. It may take you months or it may take you a couple of years. But at some point, it will be clear to you when things are going on in a dream that this is a dream. You've just awakened while you were dreaming. And believe me. It is a very, very, very interesting experience. I have a chapter on the lucid dreaming and how to enter the lucid dreaming state. And it's very, very profound and interesting. It has profound spiritual implications in addition to healing implications. The ancient uh, Egyptians and, the, and later on the, the Greeks used uh, dream incubation to actually find cures uh, for their patients. Uh, or and for themselves in dreams. In fact, for about for about over about 1,500 years, all around the Mediterranean basin, there were these dream temples that um, people would come to to have a dream analysis and to have a certain kind of dream induced, in which the the uh, the god of so the goddess of dreams would come to them in a dream and tell them what to do about their physical illness. For over 1,500 years, human beings uh, from the southern parts of, of Greece and Italy to uh, uh, Middle East to uh, Egypt over to uh, Libya were involved in this whole culture. It went on for, for you know, at least 1,500 years. It started actually, it actually started in ancient Kemetic uh, Egypt about 4,000 years before Christ. And then it up and gradually spread. And interestingly enough, most of the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the 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 headmasters of these uh, 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 sleeping academies, they were called, were women in the huh. ancient world. That's interesting. Yeah, they were. Yes, Very they were interesting. women. They were women. <laughs> and uh, uh, that yes, and that uh, uh, with the rise of uh, patriarchy, that eventually. Uh, declined, but that was the case for about 1,500 years from Egypt to Middle East to uh, Greece to uh, Italy. That was, that was the way it was. That was the, they were the keepers of, of the dream wisdom. They were the keepers of the dream Amazing. wisdom. It survived for a while uh, in um, southern um, uh, Europe, uh, on into the beginning of the uh, what we call after the fall of Rome, and entered into the Dark Ages. It's but it still persisted for a while, and then as they were beginning to come out of the Dark Ages, and women were still doing this, um, it get, really got stamped out, and it got stamped out <laughs> aggressively by the rise, believe it or not, 
of male-dominated physicians. Ah, uh, yes. no kidding. So the, mid- yeah, the dream keepers, <laughs> the dream keepers in the, in the midwives were the ones who did this. They were usually the doctors and the surgeons and so forth. Uh, but with the rise of uh, the medical academies, um, the, uh, uh, the right to do this kind of stuff was taken away from uh, women, and, uh, you know, they were seen as witches. That's, and that's how that happened. Gosh, well, we, I hope, are coming through this <laughs> a different way today. <laughs> now people have we permission, are. you know, to remember their dreams and to work with their dreams. Now, also, there's a lot of phenomenon that goes around with dreams. We have the possibility of prophetic dreams. How do you know the difference between a prophetic dream and just a regular run-of-the-mill dream? Well, if you you have prophetic dreams, chances are you've been having them for a while, okay? It's not all of a sudden you've been having your regular sleep and you wake up one night and you, boom, that's a prophetic dream. I know. No, 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 no. You've had some sense that your uh, psychic channel has been opened. Every human being, by the nature of the fact that they are a human being, has this capacity, innate capacity. And in some people, a small percentage of us, um, it's awake. The channel is open. And so that you have a chance to sort of, over time, recognize that, you know, something's going on with me because I, I get these feelings and intuitions and And then you begin to be very scientific about it. You begin to notice, well, when I have these dreams, sometimes they come true. Well, after a while, you begin to get a feeling, literally a bodily and and emotional feeling about certain kinds of dreams. And you can tell they tend to be more prophetic than others. There's a uh, chapter in the Dream Life of Families in which I, I, or several chapters in which I talk about PSI, PSI. and how that manifests in the dream state. One is, uh, you know, how dreams among family members occur, and some of those dreams uh, involve crisis telepathy. And there's a certain pattern of of, of a crisis telepathy, and it's usually somebody is in a uh, an agitated state, near death state, danger, something like that, and they're very the body is very highly aroused, adrenergic, a lot of adrenaline rushing through them, and they're really scared for one reason or another. And they're the sender. And another person is usually in a quiescent state. They're either dreaming, sleeping, resting, something else like that. And they share a deep emotional bond, what I call a family unconscious bond. It doesn't happen between strangers very much. It's usually folks who are related to each other. Because, again, most of our dream life is unconscious. Most of our family relationships have, are unconscious for, for good reasons, and um, they occur in the unconscious. So these kind of channels and patterns and ways interact uh, with each other, and that's certainly the case in the uh, the classic uh, in the literature is referred to as crisis telepathy. Mm-hmm. And then there's another one that that's PK or psychokinesis which is the movement of objects, usually unintentionally um, by one person or another. And for reasons that aren't totally really understood, most of the documentation when it happens spontaneously, spontaneously seems to be associated with young um, adolescent girls. That's what the literature says, but nobody understands why. But it seems like it's more often the case. Um, also, there's a section on precognitive dreams and uh, clairvoyance. So each one of these is a different kind of experience, and that different people have different channels open to them. Uh, some people, they're much more receptive to what's called extrasensory perception or telepathy. Some people to mm-hmm. psychokinesis. Some people to clairvoyance or clairaudience. Some people to precognition. And usually in a precognitive uh, dream, things have happened usually only a few days beforehand, or rather they get the sense of something a few days uh, beforehand. And that's the majority of people, not everybody. But some people are able to go into deep uh, psychic uh, states and, um, you know, uh, bring back accurate information. Of course, the most spectacular person in the modern, he was able to go into the dream state consciously, and uh, retrieve information from the Akashic records 
and bring it back. And very importantly, this was verified hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times by medical authorities. Yeah, he was How amazing. He Just amazing. Yeah, yep. yeah there hasn't been anybody like him since. We all have the since. capacity to do it. We all have the capacity to do it. But the channel was open in him, and it's open in, 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 um, in far fewer people, unfortunately. But it is there, and it has been uh, documented in the, in the uh, clinical record thousands and thousands of times. We just, we just don't know what to do with it. And unfortunately, <laughs> most of psychology and psychiatry, except for a few outstanding individuals, leaves it alone. But there have been a number of outstanding psychiatrists and psychologists who have devoted uh, their research, laboratory and otherwise, to exploring this. So it's a real phenomenon. It's just that you're not going to be able to go to most hospitals and understand what's going on. It's similar to um, <clears throat> another phenomenon that's real. We just don't know what to do with it most of the time. It's the near-death experience. Mm-hmm. And yes. a glimpse into the life mm-hmm. beyond the physical body. This is very real. This has been validated by dozens and dozens and dozens of physicians and emergency room people. And I'm not talking about mm-hmm. only the vision. I'm talking about people having the visit, vision and the experience that is then accurately verified later. But it's just that we just don't know what to do with it. Most the Yeah, well, the, of, uh, and there's not a lot physicians. of room in, in traditional science <laughs> for any of these things, unfortunately. But well, there hasn't it's been, great but, that, you know, I, 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 I have to agree um, with some folks who are saying that this is about to break open. Because there are too many anomalies. Too many Mm -hmm. people have experienced this. Too many physicians, emergency room doctors, experimental psychologists. And there are also too many models in contemporary physics, particularly quantum and relativistic physics, that say that this is possible. So Mm -hmm. we're about to have a paradigm shift. Yay. We're about to have a paradigm shift. Well, yes, well, it is. Well, it's, you know, happens every 40 take, years or so. We're going to take a very short commercial break, and we're going to come back, okay. and we're going to talk more about all of these anomalies that are finally going to get a voice. <clears throat> and, again, the book that Dr. Bynum has written is called The Dream Life of Families, The Psycho-Spiritual Connection. Highly recommend this book to you guys. It is terrific. So we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. You are listening to Supernatural Girls Radio. Are you ready for a new experience of freedom and powerful connection? Would you like a positive, effortless change in your life? Then come to CosmicFusion.com, where we offer the most advanced energy clearing and expansion techniques in the world with a quantum vortex energy to activate your divine blueprint and life's purpose. When your soul leads the way with cosmic fusion and quantum vortex energy, you can break clear of past difficulties and blocks with the power of the source. With cosmic fusion, the source energy does the work for you. It's easy and effortless. Listen to our free meditation right from our Cosmic Fusion website, the Cosmic Code Meditation. Sign up for one of our interactive webinars today. Come to Cosmic Fusion, www.kosmicfusion.com to experience an effortless awakening and transformation. Are you ready for an upgrade? Are you ready for a new experience of living in the fifth dimensional magic and powerful connection? Then visit CosmicFusion.com today. CosmicFusion.com Astridian is a family of cosmetic products with 98% pure ionized minerals. We combine our science with a blend of essential oils to nourish and take care of your skin's health. How does it work? All Astridian products contain the proprietary redox technology, having the capability of simulating an ionic zinc-copper superoxide dismutase effect. This free radical scavenger currently in your body has been diminished by toxins and the daily stresses of life. It is a perfectly balanced mineral complex that all $200 an hour dermatologists, their professors, and ancient history have proven. Redox technology is a process of reducing the skin's oxidation by transferring electrons from a radical state to a stress-free normal condition. Oxidative stress is a form of cellular aging, and as science has proven, a precursor to disease. The free radical theory of aging 
states that organisms age because cells accumulate free radical damage over time. Damaged cells are not beautiful, but healthy cells are. The Astridium family is presented in four different uses that cover unique benefits to your body. They are the Essential Anti-Aging Series, the Multivitamin Series, Sports Series, and Professional Series. Regain your youth with the power of Astridium. Visit www.astridium.com and inquire. Use the code SUPERNATURAL and receive a 10% discount on your first purchase. Astridium, the beauty of being healthy. Your property tax bill. Have you seen it lately? It's frightening. Your property taxes are going up while your home value is going down. It's time to fight back and win. For the real truth about the property tax system, get Attorney Pat Quintilian's book, Are You Getting Screwed on Your Property Taxes? How to Find Out and How to Fix It. Attorney Quintilian answers all your questions and gives you the facts you need to fight a property tax bill that is spiraling out of control. You'll also read about what happens to property owners who don't check their property records, only to find out too late they're taxed on square footage, fixtures, and even buildings that they don't own. Is this happening to you? Learn your rights. Buy Attorney Pat Quintilian's book today. Are you getting screwed on your property taxes? How to find out and how to fix it. Available on Amazon.com. Welcome back, everyone, to Supernatural Girls Radio. I'm your host, Patricia Baker. I am here with my co-host, PK, <clears throat> Patricia Kirkman, and our guest tonight. We have a terrific guest, and his name is Dr. Edward Bruce Bynum. He's the author of a new book, The Dream Life of Families. It's an excellent book. We are talking about the psi phenomenon and dreams and how people are starting to accept some of these things. Even if we don't have an explanation, we're talking about it. So, Dr. Bynum, here's another question, and this just came in as a text. There is a phenomenon of the uh, the hag. People have what? woken up the hag. People wake up in the middle of the night, and they see this old woman face in front of them, hair blowing in the breeze, and they can't move. They're paralyzed. And it seems to be a fairly universal phenomenon. It can happen to anybody in any place on the planet. Are you familiar with that one? Um, in the tradition. Oh, we're losing you a little bit. You're breaking up. There are. Oh, okay. Is that better? Yes, it is. Thank you. I'm aware of two traditions that um, have uh, used a variation of this, two quite uh, uh, successful ends. One is there is a tradition among uh, uh, the folks of uh, West Africa in particular, uh, uh, Nigeria, Ghana, uh, Benin, um, that has spread to uh, South America, the Caribbean, and so forth. And it is a phenomenon where uh, it called, quote, the witches are riding you. The oh. witches are riding you. Right. Oh, boy. And what happens, what happens is a person goes into uh, sleep and then a sleep paralysis state, but they, they remain awake. In other words, every night when you fall asleep, uh, you go through a period of time in which you are awake, 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 and then you, quote, fall asleep, unquote. Well, as you fall asleep, if you've ever been holding someone uh, when they fell asleep, you'll notice that they're they're breathing a certain way. And just as they are mm-hmm. falling asleep, the body trembles a little bit and then gets relaxed. Yeah. And then they go to mm. sleep. And then they are presumably, quote, unconscious. Well, and the body has to be paralyzed partially when you're sleeping and dreaming because you can't – it would be dangerous to get up and act out the phenomena that goes on in your sleep. Um, if you if you did, okay, right, um, it would. In be. other words, if you're dreaming about if you're dreaming about uh, walking across the street, it's not a healthy thing for you to get up and go walk across the street. Okay? <laughs> right, it is. That's not that's not a yes. healthy thing to do. So of necessity, hello. Yes, we're here. We're listening. Yeah, of, of necessity, the body is 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 temporarily paralyzed in various places when we're sleeping and dreaming. 
Well, in the situation of 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 of, of uh, the witches are riding, or and presumably the hag, a person falls, the body falls asleep, but the mind does not fall asleep. The body falls asleep and is partially paralyzed, but the mind is wide awake. And if it's wide awake, uh, you have vivid dreams, vivid visual experiences, but you can't move. And it's, it, it can be a terrifying experience. Okay? Yes, it so can that be. Is one, I, what, it can be, it, unless yes. you realize yes. what's going on. But it feels like your body can't move, and the first thought that comes to mind is I'm not going to be able to, to breathe. Well, a, a moment's reflection will show that, yes, you are breathing and that um, uh, you've probably been through this before. And again, we all go through that every night for a couple of seconds when we're falling asleep. But the case of uh, the witches are riding you, a person slips into that state, and then the mind is awake, but the body is asleep, and they're paralyzed, and the mind zooms off. It literally travels. It literally why travels. Why the common the symbol? Why, why the common symbol of the hag, the old woman? Uh, what is it about that? I, I don't know. I, su- I suspect, however, I suspect that it is an ancient archetypal image of a spiritual master, a woman, a spiritual master, initiating the person into the transpersonal states of consciousness. Why do I say that? Because the ancient uh, Kemetic Egyptians, those are the Egyptians that were there before the Arabs, the ones who, the ones who actually built the pyramids. The, uh, the pyramids were not built by people from Libya or from Saudi Arabia. They were built by the indigenous uh, peoples there, African peoples there. When they built them, they had initiations in those temple in, in the pyramids. Pyramids were not places where pharaohs were buried. There are no bones in the pyramids. No. The pharaohs were buried in the Valley of the Kings. No. The, the three great pyramids of the Giza Plateau, and lots of others, by the way, that have been re- discovered recently. But the pyramids were places of initiation. And what would happen is a person would uh, uh, go through uh, uh, a long period of time, just like we do in universities uh, today, in schools today, of body purification and learning uh, about the uh, the philosophy and the religions and the medicine and, and so on and so forth. Then when it came time for their initiation, they were led into the pyramids by both uh, male and female priests, and they would lie down inside of the tomb, be covered over, and they would be inside of the tomb there for a certain period of time, usually a couple of days. And while inside, it's totally dark, and the person would go into a deep, deep trance state, and they would have an OBE, or out-of-body experience. It, It was Today we would call it in psychology and psychiatry, we would say that they have a dissociative experience. That's what it's called technically today, a dissociative experience. But it was called, you know, or an out-of-body experience. And they would leave their physical body, and they would have an enormous range of and spiritual and other experiences. Psychic and spiritual are not the same. They would have a number of those kinds of experiences, but they would be prepared for that. They were prepared by their training for that. And then after several days or whatever it might be, they would then be taken out of the tomb and brought back with everybody else, and they had gone through the rites of initiation, resurrection, and rebirth. The whole story and mythology and mythos and reality of resurrection began with the ancient Egyptians, Five and six thousand years ago, five and six thousand years ago, and that's where it was learned, and that's why later on, in the moved up in the Middle East, that became part of the religion of Christianity. Yeah, they kind the of stole a lot, <laughs> didn't they? Yeah, but, they stole an awful lot. But the point is, the point is that we still have the capacity to do that today, and we do it spontaneously, haphazardly today. But that's where I believe that hag uh, imagery comes it's from. Very, a deep, deep yeah, archetypal that, image of a of a so, spiritual master 
if you have this experience with a hag, as long as you could stop screaming long enough, <laughs> she might that's actually right. teach you something. <laughs> well, that's that that that's there. You're right, and that's the power of what's called lucid dreaming. When you become aware that you are dreaming, then you can steady your your fear, and you can stare down and into um, what that image is doing. And if you, with enough training, you can instead of running from it, you turn and you ask. What do you want or what what are you here to teach me while you're dreaming? And you will be profoundly moved by what the image, what she will tell you. Because she will tell you something profound and deep about yourself because it's your deeper self talking to yourself. And it, it's quite intimate. It's quite intimate. It's powerful, very powerful to and be able it, to face your fears. Trans, it, is, it is transformative. It is a profound transformative experience. You don't have to be rich. You don't have to uh, be uh, overeducated, but you do have to have commitment and faith and a determination that your spiritual life is as important, if not more important, than in many other aspects of your life. And so uh, that archetypal hag image is, a, is the image of a spiritual master here to teach you something. You know, in the Western world, the hag has taken on a negative connotation. In the ancient yes. world, she was not negative. She was she was Athena. Hmm? She was Isis. Hmm? She was the, uh-huh. she initiated you into the temple mysteries. Amazing. Oh, yes, that yes. is really a wonderful explanation. Mysteries. I'm loving this. This is a terrific explanation about this uh, phenomenon. And it makes perfect sense. It really does. And it also, you're also drawing from some other aspects of using your dreams to confront your fears, which I like. And yeah. did that start with the Sinoi tribe? Is that because I've heard this over and over again, the Sinoi tribe in Malaysia, where they taught yeah. their children to face fears in their dreams? Is that where that comes from? Well, no, but it, 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 they, they were practicing this, but the practice itself is literally thousands and thousands of years old. The Sonoi did it, and they didn't do it as much as people thought they did it, but nevertheless, they did do it. And, um, but the ancient uh, Egyptians used to do the same thing. Um, they would teach you to go into the dream state, go into the, uh, the, the, the temple and, the, and the, be buried in the tomb, and there confront the great gods of fear. And in the ancient Egyptian world, the great gods of fear were the crocodile and the, uh, 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 the uh, snake and uh, um, many of the uh, other gods of their pantheon. Anubis was, this, was a terrifying god of the underworld. But you had to confront him before you could pass on. And so part of the training in the temples, of per onks they were called, which were both medical and philosophical places, uh, that is where one learned how to confront those in the waking state and the dream state. You meditated upon this. You dreamed about it. You talked about it with the priests and the priestesses about it. And you prepared yourself. Because the ancient Egyptians, they understood that physical life, physical embodiment was a temporary state. It was a temporary state on a long, long journey. This is the same thing Edgar Casey told us. He told us the same thing. All of our deep psychics and mystics, they tell us the same thing. And you know who else tells us this? Quantum mechanics. Mm-hmm. It does. Yes. It does. It tells exactly. us the physical body is the condensation of energy. But energy is all pervasive. It's neither created nor destroyed and endlessly changed. It is quantum mechanics and relativity. And so the physical body is real. Don't get me wrong. It's quite real. But it is a limited subset of reality and who and what we are is much vaster than that so we have to prepare much. ourselves for yes it. now and with ancient studying egyptians dream is one way of doing that it, it definitely is and then also if you look at the ancient egyptian culture and everything they knew about the brain i mean if you look at oh, the yes. sacred eye you're looking at the pineal gland there's so much yes. that they knew and understood that we are just scratching the surface on now don't you think Yes, well, the, the ancient Egyptians were the first ones to discover the unconscious. 
They were. They called it by name. They, they had two names for the unconscious mind. It was called the primeval waters of uh, Nun and the Amenta, the all-black underworld of, of objects, things, creatures, and so on and so forth. But they knew what the unconscious was, they, and they called it by name. They called it uh, by name. So they knew that, and they knew an enormous amount about physical, underline the word, physical medicine. In fact, their knowledge of physical medicine was not exceeded until about the, the middle of the 18th century in Europe. Remember, the ancient Egyptians, uh, that because of the practice of mummification, they took apart the body. And they right. knew all the different parts of the body. They knew about the meninges of the brain. They knew about what happened if you uh, put pressure in this part of the brain, how it would affect that part of the body. They had a certain uh, form of neurosurgery called trephination where they would go in and relieve pressure on the brain, usually encountered in battlefield trauma of one kind or another, to help the person. So they knew about this because they studied mummification for thousands of years. So they knew about this dura matter of the skin, uh, or rather of the brain. They had uh, over 200 anatomical parts of the, of the, of the uh, head. Uh, they were quite sophisticated about this. Quite sophisticated. And yeah, they really are were. And arrogant that makes us think that we're the you know, last <laughs> I know, two centuries. We don't turn, we knew anything. No, you know, yeah. they also knew that cancer can be cured with high heat. There's actual ancient writings where they discover this, and it is true. Cancer cells die at like 106 degrees. So they were so advanced in so many ways, yet we're, we haven't even found a way to tap into all the knowledge they have, which is kind of sad. We're, we've missed out on a lot of it these It is kind things. of sad. It is kind of sad. Mm-hmm. They knew a, a great deal, and we've forgotten a lot of it. Some things they knew, um, uh, but they were wrong. We should also acknowledge that. Right. They, 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 weren't, they weren't accurate in everything. The Egyptians, uh, they were aware of the brain for sure. But you know where they, 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 they located um, uh, the seat of consciousness? Not where? in the brain, in the heart and the liver. Hmm. Yes. Hmm. They, they, they located the seat of human consciousness in the heart, the ab, and the liver. Yes, that was part Maybe of the, that was right. whole, part of the whole thing about <laughs> that was part of the whole thing about the mummification. They took great effort to preserve the heart and preserve the liver, and very often, believe it or not, they tossed out the brain. <laughs> it wasn't, Maybe they it had the right idea, Doctor Bynum. Maybe they figured out. Well, they didn't really consider good. it. They didn't consider it uh, after death. They didn't consider it that worthy, but they did consider the heart. So you know. Uh, each age has its treasures, and each age throws out certain things. And today, we throw out enormous amounts of information, and also we close, we shut, we lock doors that would open up our, uh, uh, our experience vastly. We dismiss, unfortunately, unfortunately, to our enormous loss, we throw out so many people who've had near-death experiences, we say, oh, well, you were... You were just having a, a chemically induced uh, fever dream or you weren't getting enough oxygen and so on and so forth. And um, it's interesting in that regard. There have been a, a, a number of books out recently <laughs> written by former uh, physician skeptics, some of them neurosurgeons. You know, they would uh-huh. tell their patients who reported this to them that, mm-hmm. oh, well, that's just, you know, blah, 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 or, well, that's very nice, but you're back now, blah, blah, and they would dismiss it. And then they experienced it, and they had a well, whole and, different understanding of yes, it. Yes, exactly. And the In curious, fact, sir. Yeah, and then they had the curious social experience, interpersonal experience, cultural experience, professional experience of telling their colleagues who then began to dismiss them as they had dismissed <laughs> others. Right. Well, you know, it's an interesting thing that's changing. We had Dr. Kolbabi on our show, and he was getting all the doctors to finally admit that they've had, you know, these psi experiences, and they've had experiences with their patients with near death. And when the doctors would talk to each other about it, and they found camaraderie with that, they found acceptance with that, and so it's opened the door 
for yeah. medical professionals to start accepting this, which is wonderful. Because how long ago was it, Dr. Raymond Moody and Dr. Kenneth Ring? Those were the people that were talking about that. How many years ago? Forty they years were ago. Talking about that, they were, they were talking about that in the late seventies and nineteen eighties. Right. And they were considered right. French. Mm-hmm. Well, it's it's still taboo, clinically speaking, but it's recognized that this is. Uh, what's the phrase? This is an anomaly, which means, yeah, it's real. We just don't have any explanation for it. We're about we're on the cusp of changing our perception of consciousness. In well, the next, I think in the next twenty years or so, that's going to break out, and we're going to recognize that, you know, like we, what many physicists say, the ground of reality is consciousness, not the other way around. Mm-hmm. Consciousness mm-hmm. is not an every phenomenon of the brain; rather, the brain transmits consciousness. And I realize that's not a, a, a predominant view right now, but more and more physicians and neuroscientists and uh, people in experimental areas of physics are coming to see that, including a lot of psychologists are coming to see that. So in uh, right. the dream life of families, I touch upon that uh, somewhat. Um, and uh, there's a chapter I have, as I mentioned earlier, that goes into some detail about the psi phenomena how ESP happens in dreams. You know, it's not the predominant experience that happens in family dreams. Most family dreams are, are more about our emotional relationships with each other. Mm-hmm. Okay? They're not necessarily psychic at all. They're deeply emotional. Um, and some of them are, you know, about family conflicts, uh, family loyalties, um, you know, the regular wolf and wolf of living in, in intimate circumstances with people with all the conflicts, good things, the bad things. You know, family life is complex. So all of that is... <laughs> that's that's that is for it. sure. <laughs> that's oh, yeah. for sure, you know. I mean, you, yes. you can have a brother or sister you can't stand, but you still love them. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. That's right. right. So it's, it, it can be very... Con- and and, and uh, so the, the family dynamics and fam- the root patterns of our relationships developed in our family are reflected in all of our relationships with all other people, how we handle conflict, how we handle authority, how we handle love, rejection, all of that kind of stuff have its, has its origins in the psychodynamics of family life. And so actually most of the dream life of families is about that. With, a, with several good chapters, I hope, that do focus, did focus on ESP, crisis telepathy, psychokinesis, precognition, and the pattern that I saw that keeps being reflected when that kind of happens, you can't make it happen, but you can kind of predict when it's going to happen, and you can recognize the pattern when it does happen. But it's the kind of situation that you can't make happen. You can increase the likelihood of it, but you can't make it happen. Well, there's hmm. been a lot of interesting things that have occurred with dreams when it's coming to something like 9-11, because before 9-11 happened, there were lots of people that had precognitive dreams about it. And these weren't necessarily (laughs) dream experts, you know, that had been paying a lot of attention to their dreams. Right. These are everyday people. And you talk a lot about how we're all connected. We're all one. And I think that illustrates it quite well, that so many people felt this was going to happen before it happened. And it was such a extreme event it was so it was so out of context for so many people here in the united states but yet people perceived that this was going to happen before it happened well that's true and uh there have been uh attempts i've heard of of people trying to connect thousands and thousands of people to report their dreams and see what kind of patterns are emerging to possibly predict some of these phenomena. I don't know if it ever got off the ground, but I remember being at uh, several meetings of the International Association for the Study of Dreams with other dreamers of psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, writers, artists, and so on. And there was much discussion of that possibility of developing something like that. I think it would be I, fascinating. I suspect, I suspect that that's, that's, that's a possibility that's more complex. I, I think, however, the... The, 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 the way that it would, if it's going to happen, it would probably happen by uh, an organization or the government or foundation or whatever, uh, gathering and having on staff 
dozens upon dozens of proven precognitive dreamers and watching their dreams and see what comes up. That's much more that likely be to be able to be controlled mm-hmm. and also, by, quite frankly, to keep secret. Uh-huh. A lot of stuff oh. in the government is kept secret. Yeah, that's too much. A lot of too stuff much. in the government that, that yeah. is kept secret we don't like because that. <laughs> the, the government doesn't think we're ready for it. And I think it gro- grossly underestimates us. Oh, absolutely. There's a lot of stuff there so that in the future will be like, well, of course. Of course. Well, yeah. yes. I mean, it's it's obvious that there's so much more to us. We are more than our physical body. And the government does try to cover a lot of these things up. And they try to silence people, for example, <clears throat> that have had interdimensional or UFO contact. And, and it's it's absolutely appalling. It's appalling. Because all of this is a well, part of I, our you know, consciousness. Well, I mean, I, I think so, too. But, you know, on the other hand, here, here's, here's a counter-argument. Here's a counter-argument, okay? I know it's not a popular one, but here's a counter-argument. Let's say, well, let's let's say that it's <laughs> 1947, and uh, we have a couple of uh, downed UFOs in Roswell, okay? And mm-hmm. it's clearly, and we recover mm-hmm. spacecraft and alien bodies. Uh, if the government had come out the next day and said, oh, by the way, creatures from another world or another dimension have come to Earth, what that would have done is it would have set off widespread panic and fear throughout the world. It would have. So what is, what is a, a reasonable what about way to today? handle that? What, no, well, this is what, what I'm about leading today? up to. What about today? A reasonable, way gonna, to handle that, a reasonable way to handle that would be to have people in Hollywood and other places begin making movies, cultural things about spacecraft, about people from or, or beings from other worlds coming to the Earth. And you do that over three or four generations until it gets to the point where people are not frightened of it anymore. And you gradually get people acclimated to it. Hmm? Isn't There's that an argument to be made that well, that's a better way to introduce a, a, a population that otherwise would be terrified. Yeah, but they're doing it now. We're now more terrified of the the, govern, the government than we are of that's the UFOs. Right. That's been that's exactly. what's been created is a culture a of lies and harassment, mm-hmm. and now. They're more uh, to be feared than anything from another planet. That's what they've well, created. That's, that's true, and uh, that order, that government order, is obviously crumbling right in front of our eyes. We all see it. You know, right. uh, the, the, the former Soviet Union studied this, and you know the Russians—they've been public about it. That this is what's going on. Mm-hmm. They have. You know, uh, uh, they've come out and they've said in so many words, "Yeah, we got, we have." A little visitors, not a little, but we have visitors from other worlds. Other countries in the former Soviet Union, leaders of those countries have said that. The former defense minister of Canada has said it. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of whistleblowers in the U.S. have said it. So it's, it's there. It's just a matter of it slowly, slowly, slowly coming out. But it nevertheless, it will come out. And when it does, officially... Population will not be terrified. They'll be like, yeah, I kind of knew that. And that's how we were kind of introduced to it. And that makes mm-hmm. sense in a certain way. That makes sense in a certain way. But the, and the old government uh, ways of handling it are falling apart. But that was the best they could come up with at the time. That was the best they could come up with at the time. You're very generous, Dr. Bynum. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm giving him the benefit man. of the doubt. Yeah. You really are <laughs> giving them the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> well, right. the tree is bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a question here uh, from a text, and this person is asking Dr. Bynum. They want to know: Can is there a way to use and work with my dreams to become more psychic, more intuitive? Is there a way to do that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, first of all, you have to remember, recognize it. The very fact that you are a human being, you are already on some level a psychic being. 
you already, you don't have to make yourself psychic. It's more like developing that. And one of the first and the easiest ways is to keep an honest catalog, not a catalog, an honest uh, 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 diary, so to speak, of your dreams so that you begin to notice that your dreams have certain themes that repeat themselves. If you just took one night's dream, it could be about anything. But if you kept writing your dreams down, don't try to analyze them, just write them down, purely descriptive, give it a date, and very importantly, very, very importantly, give the dream a name. And just keep a notebook of it. After several months, three, four months or so, and it just takes you five minutes in the morning, after several months, you begin to notice that certain kinds of themes repeat themselves in your dreams. And those are the themes about your life that are critical and specific to you, regardless of what they, they may be. This is your story. This is your movie. This is your novel that you are writing about yourself. Then after a while, you'll begin to notice that certain things keep popping up. One of the easiest ones to do is to notice what kind of symbols keep popping up in your dreams. Let's say that um, you notice when you write your dreams down that very often, for whatever reasons, your hands show up in your dreams. Uh, you're either cooking food, you're ironing a shirt, a dress, you are raking leaves, you are driving a car, whatever it might be, but you're using your hands. Then you can begin to start meditating just before you go to sleep on remember my hands and asking yourself when you're awake during the day when you're just using your hands, is this a dream? Just do it reflexively. Is this a dream? 99.9% .9 of the time, the answer will be no. But every now and then, when you ask yourself when you're doing something with your hands, is this a dream? It'll be apparent to you that, yes, I am dreaming. You've just become lucid. You've just become lucid. You've just become self-aware that you're dreaming. And then the door is open. And that allows you to begin to deepen your mind. And that can go in a direction that is in the direction of healing, in a psychic direction, or another direction. It kind of depends on you. And nobody can quite tell you that. You have to experience it yourself. But once you begin to do it, fascinating. And it begins to open up your interior life in a way that you hadn't anticipated before. So it's not illegal, but it is taboo. Hmm. And that is a way to become more... Okay, so that's more a naturally that's a good answer psychic. now here's another question from another listener yes it makes sense now this is a question from someone who's been working on their dreams for a while with their dreams for a while and she says that there are um, ancestors that she has very little knowledge about from her immediate family however she is aware that there are some shamans in her past uh, from a European country. Would she be able to get in contact with them through her dreams? That's the question. Yes, the answer is emphatic yes. And the way to, one of the ways of doing that is to consciously and intentionally, and maybe even verbally, invite them in, especially before you go to sleep at night. If by any chance you have a drawing or a photograph of, a, of, an, of an ancestor. Take it out of the, the archives the, the, and, and keep it at your desk or, your, or your, above your uh, bed. Uh, do some reading about your family history. If they've got written records about your family history, great. If not, you can read about the region, the people who used to live there, so on and so forth, photographs of it. But familiar, familiarize yourself with the environment and your desire and your will to do it, over time, it will get through to your unconscious mind that, yes, I'm allowing this to happen. Yes, I'm inviting you in. Yes, I want to do that. And it, sooner or later, gradually, it will become the case. And read some about it. it is, you, you don't, don't, don't be anti-intellectual about this. It is perfectly okay to do uh, clinical reading, scientific reading, popular reading, novel reading, and self-educated family history. Again, uh, the dream life of families is, is about not only our current family, 
the waking state, but also our family that we share dreams with. It's also about our ancestors. We're all connected in the deep common web of this. You know, in uh, some societies, like in some societies in the in the West Africa in particular and, and in South America, the family is understood to be several levels. There's the current family that's living today, living in the same house, the same compound, the same community. Then the next level of our families that we're communicating with are people who have just died. Yes, they call the recently died, the recently dead. And then the next level mm-hmm. of those are, have been our ancestors who've been gone for several generations. But they appear in our dreams. They do appear in our dreams. And then finally, the other level of our family life is a generation yet to be born. Yes, generation yet to be born. And they're all part of the same family web. And I know that that's an unusual we- an idea in the Western world, but peoples in South America, Africa, indigenous societies, Native American societies, that is how they understood the web of family dynamics, the web of family relations. And so in the dream life of families, we talk about that and how that happens not only uh, psychically, but also have how that happens medically. Because if you think about it, you are your great-grandparents' great bodies in continuum through time and space. Mm. You have the same often genetic makeup as your great-great-grandparents. You have their same bodies, hmm? same mm. cells. That's very and interesting. In some cases, kind in, of in some cases the same <laughs> memories. In some cases, the same yeah. memories. It's called the family unconscious and the collective unconscious. That's what it's called in psychology and psychiatry. And I tried in the fa- dream life of families to make that accessible to folks so that they can realize that this is what's going on in their lives. It's not out there in some library somewhere. It's right inside of your body, inside of your brain, inside of your heart, and inside of your living self, the tissues of your body, your DNA. It's quite real and quite close. If, if a person has fears, were those fears also part of their, the previous family members many times? Yes, or they, or oftentimes they are. New fears? There is a uh, there is a there was a, a psychiatrist at um, I think it was the University of Virginia, uh, Ian Stevenson, who studied uh, a reincarnation. He did. He studied. He's a, a psychiatrist, physician. He made hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of studies of people, their memories. And very often, when people died suddenly, when they were uh, somebody claimed to be them in a later life in some sort of way, mm-hmm. they had birth markings on their body. Of the trauma. Yes, check it out. Ian Stevenson. Oh, yeah. Go to the library yeah, or you can look sense. it up on the oh. internet. Ian Stevenson. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's about that the physical trauma that people experienced yeah. in their families that then brought them through another life. And I touch upon that briefly Amazing. in the Dream Life of Families. But my most, mm-hmm. and do more focus on ESP, crisis telepathy, PK, and also the vast majority of other dreams, which are about physical health pregnancy, dreams in the trimesters, and so on, and also creativity. Well, Dr. Dreams. Biden, so unfortunately, it, we've come to the end of our time together, and it's been such a delight to have you on the show. You have written a brilliant book, The Dream Life of Families. We highly recommend it to our audience. Get it as a Christmas present and exactly. enlighten yourselves as to where you can go with this. Yes. It'll so, anyways, Dr. Bynum, thank you so through. much. Oh, it was yes. Delightful. It's, it's great. Thank it's you a very, very nice much. book. Well, I appreciate having a chance so, to reach out and, and, and touch folks, and I hope that uh, the Dream Life of Families is interesting for folks. It's, you know, uh, I put my heart and soul into it. It's right there in the libraries and webs and every uh, internet. I mean, it's not difficult to get a hold of, but it's about the real us. The real mm-hmm. of yeah. blood, well, it's a body, great book, brain. everybody. Yes, it is. Thank you, Dr. Bynum. And we'll be back next week with another great show. We'll have George Lugo. Don't miss it. Until then, we'll see you on the Blue Highway. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thanks for listening. Tune in next week for another radio adventure with Supernatural Girl.
Hey, thanks, Dr. Here. Bynum. That was a terrific show. Good, good. Was. I'm glad we, yes, we yeah. yeah, it seems like we were we were getting heated up there. <laughs> yes. It was Very great good indeed. I know our audience loved it. They loved it. It was a terrific show. Thank you so much. It is really a great book and I'm sure that you'll get people interested in purchasing it. So thank you again for coming on the show. It was wonderful. Well, I really appreciate it. It was very thought-provoking and stimulating for me, too. All right. like to hear that. <laughs> Keep us posted. Okay. We know you're going to be writing another book, so we'd love to have you come back. Well, uh, great. I'm, uh, we could talk about dark light consciousness, too, but that goes off in a totally different direction. Okay. We'll have to get a copy of it and read it. And, uh, well, that's right. Yeah, it's in the yeah, same well, place, but it goes off in a totally that. different direction, but... We'll see. So I appreciate being on your program, and uh, we'll see you further down the road. Take care. Okay, have thanks, a good Dr. Holiday. Bynum. Good night. All right. Good night. Good night. Good night, my dear. Hey, I hope you feel better. Well, I'll tell you, I sat in the chair with the ice pack as best I could until I couldn't take it. Finally, I realized I'm on my phone, got my bed, and I've been stretched out on top of the ice pack so I could be my back was oh, killing me. God. God. Oh you so poor I, thing. I, well I doubled the ice pack. I I, I thought well, I feel <laughs> so bad having to say I can't do and I thought well if I could just keep the ice on it, which has helped because it goes up Yes. That damn yeah. table was well it's just a slave board and my spine just felt like raw meat by the time I got out of there. And that damn oh, little box. Oh, so bad for you. So the oh, ice pack that's helped. So much I, could, it, I made it through it. I thought, oh, I feel so bad. Well, I thank say, you. Oh, I, I was, <laughs> well, I was happy to have you with me. Believe me, I was. So it was a fun show. Well, really good. He's very, very interesting. Very interesting indeed. And there's so yes. many things that... Yeah. I just got to get this shit taken care of. Hopefully they'll find something and get this turned around so I can have my life back. My God. I know. Crazy. I know it really. It's been a long time since you felt well. So you rest. Yeah. I'll let you run and just take care of yourself. Then let me know what that MRI says when they get back to you. Okay. They said it should be back on Friday. Unfortunately, my doctor's off until Monday. <laughs> what else? Oh, all right. I no. know. Well, let me know as soon as you hear, okay? I shall, honey. You take good care, too, all right? Lots of love. I, I will. Lots of love to you. Thanks. Good night, hon. Bye-bye.